important positions, Mayor Eric Garcetti to be the ambassador to India, Ambassador Donald Bloom to be the ambassador to Pakistan, and Dr. Amy Gutman to be the ambassador to Germany. Congratulations to the three of you. We appreciate your willingness, as well as that of your family, uh, to serve the country in this capacity. We have some of our colleagues here today, and we want to recognize them first. I understand that Senators Toomey and Casey will be introducing Dr. Gutman, and Senator Padilla will be introducing Mayor Garcetti. So uh, let's start with uh, Senator Toomey. Thank you very much, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, and members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you for allowing me to briefly introduce Dr. Amy Gutman and express my strong support for her nomination to be our next U.S. Ambassador to Germany. Dr. Gutman, thank you for your willingness to serve in such an important leadership role. As members of this committee likely know, Dr. Gutman currently serves as the president of the University of Pennsylvania. And before I highlight just a few of her many accomplishments there, I want to acknowledge a different aspect of Penn's history, which I think is relevant to this hearing. Penn's founder, Benjamin Franklin, was one of the U.S. most accomplished diplomats. He skillfully na na navigated the complicated dynamics of 18th century European politics to promote American ideals and protect our nascent democracy abroad. Of course, much has changed since then, but some of the diplomatic challenges that Franklin faced remain the same today, including faithfully and ardently defending U.S. interests, even in times of disagreement with our allies while maintaining close relationships. We face this challenge today in our relationship with one of our most important European allies, Germany. We rely on Germany as a major security and trade partner, especially given its role in the European Union. And amidst increasing global threats to the U.S. and Europe, strong U.S. representation to Germany, to Germany is critical. I am confident that Dr. Gutman will rise to meet these and other challenges facing the U.S. and our European allies. Dr. Gutman earned bachelor's and doctorate degrees from Harvard University, a master's degree from London School of Economics. She subsequently spent over 20 years at Princeton University in a myriad of roles, most recently as university provost. In 2004, Dr. Gutman became the eighth president of Penn, a position she still holds today. And during her tenure, she dramatically grew Penn's endowment, expanded Penn's commitment to science, technology, and medical innovation, and enhanced the university's engagement in the Philadelphia community, among other things. Dr. Gutman is a widely respected expert in subjects ranging from ethics to healthcare to political philosophy. And she's received countless awards and honors, including being named to Fortune's World's 50 Greatest Leaders list in 2018. Her impact at Penn has been recognized, including by the many Penn students who regard her as a committed and passionate leader. These accomplishments, coupled with her commitment to global leadership and experience in academia and the highest levels, have prepared Dr. Gutman well for the role of UN Ambassador. As I conclude, I also want to note the significance of Dr. Gutman's nomination in the context of her family's history. Her father fled religious persecution in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and her family's return to Germany in the form of U.S. Ambassador Amy Gutman will be an extraordinary moment. I am confident Dr. Gutman will approach this next mission with the same ingenuity, tenacity, and dedication as she did over the nearly 20 years she has spent at Penn, and I look forward to supporting Dr. Gutman's nomination, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Casey. Mr. Chairman, thanks very much for this opportunity. I want to start by thanking you and the committee for this opportunity to, to talk about Dr. Gutman. But if I refer to her as Amy throughout some of my remarks, uh, that's because I've known her for the better part of 15 years, know her character, know her commitment uh, not only to academic excellence and the, the excellence um, personified by those who are graduates of Penn, but also for the commitment she's made to the city of Philadelphia and our Commonwealth, and now on, a, on an even bigger stage, her commitment to our country by putting herself forward for this kind of public service. I wanted to start by talking about her tenure at Penn. Since 2004, Amy has served as the longest tenured president of the university. During her, her 18 years of commitment to the university, the city of Philadelphia, our Commonwealth, 
and our Commonwealth, President Gutman transformed the university into a more inclusive, a more innovative, and more impactful academic institution. In 2006, she led the largest fundraising effort in Penn history to support financial aid for students in need. Other initiatives, like the President's Innovation Prize and Engagement Prize, have offered students opportunities to turn their startup and service ideas into reality. She's also focused on the development of the community around the university through programs like Penn Compact 2022 and the Netter Center for Community Partnerships. As the leader of Philadelphia's largest private employer, Dr. Gutman heads one of the Commonwealth's most powerful economic engines with an estimated total economic impact of $21.5 billion annually in the region. While leading the university, she's continued to publish cutting-edge scholarship on the intersection of political science, ethics, education, and philosophy. In 2019, she published her 17th book, and she remains one of the top political theorists in the United States. Outside of her roles at the university, Amy has long supported Philadelphia and the country through a variety of interdisciplinary roles, including as a board member at Vanguard and chair of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues. Her many years of leadership at Penn, applied expertise in political science, and commitment to the community prepare her well to be United States Ambassador to Germany and represent U.S. interests on one with one of our most important allies. I don't think I have to explain to the members of the committee the importance of this bilateral relationship, especially now. She's prepared to do this job, and I can testify to her uh, character, uh, her commitment to public service, and her willingness at an important time in our nation's history to serve as U.S. Ambassador to Germany. So I want to thank the committee. I want to thank Dr. Gutman and her family for this commitment to the country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Casey. Uh, timing is everything in life, and Senator Padilla has now made it on time to introduce Mayor Garcetti. Thank you, uh, Chairman Menendez and uh, Ranking Member Risch. It's my uh, pleasure to be here to introduce Mayor Eric Garcetti from my home city of Los Angeles and the great state of California as President Biden's nominee for ambassador to India. Mayor Garcetti's credentials are impressive. He is a graduate of Columbia University, a Rhodes Scholar, and a 12-year veteran of the United States Navy Reserve. Now, Mayor Garcetti was first elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 2001, where we served together for five years. In 2006, Mayor Garcetti succeeded me as president of the city council as I launched my campaign for California State Senate. And in 2013, he was elected to serve as mayor of the city of Los Angeles, the second largest city in America. In his time as mayor, he has led the city through a number of challenges while leveraging the position to exert influence over regional national, and international organizations. He served as chair of LA Metro, one of the largest public transit agencies in the country. He's the founder of Climate Mayors, a national bipartisan group of more than 400 mayors adopting the Paris Climate Agreement. He championed Los Angeles' successful bid to host the 2028 Summer Olympics. And Mayor Garcetti also chairs C40 Cities, an international network of the world's largest cities taking action on the climate crisis. And he led the organization's expansion in India. In the past year and a half, he has used that network to spur international collaboration in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and share resources and best practices around the world. His commitment to public service and leadership on issues from climate to human rights will be instrumental to his new role as ambassador to India. India is a critical partner on the front lines of many of the world's biggest challenges, from COVID to climate change to national security. Our close cooperation will help support global security, fight the climate crisis, and further economic growth. Mr. Chairman, I urge the committee to support Mayor Garcetti's nomination, and I thank you for this opportunity. 
Thank you, Senator Padilla. And uh, we know you have other important duties, so when you need to, please feel free to excuse yourself. Uh, let me turn to uh, a few brief remarks on these three nominees. Mayor Garcetti, we welcome your nomination to this post at a critical time in the U.S.-India relationship with more than 1.3 billion people and the sixth largest economy in the world. India is a vital strategic partner for the United States. As a member of the Quad alongside the United States, Japan, and Australia, India is playing a greater role in helping maintain a free and open Indo-Pacific. In September, the Biden administration hosted the first ever in-person Quad Summit here in Washington. When it comes to the bilateral relationship, there is much to discuss. In particular, the shared threat of climate change and India's growing need for electricity presents an opportunity for deeper cooperation. That's why I introduced the Prioritizing Clean Energy and Climate Cooperation with India Act that would help advance India's climate goals. In addition, dealing with the coronavirus must also remain a core element of our bilateral engagement. As you know, India was on the front lines of the pandemic earlier this year when it faced a devastating surge in new cases. As we deepen our partnership with New Delhi, there will inevitably be areas of friction, including concerns related to India's purchase of Russian military hardware and reports of democratic backsliding and discrimination against religious minorities. I expect you to be frank with your Indian counterparts, not just on the areas of cooperation, but also on these differences, all of which are bipartisan priorities for this committee. New Delhi will need to address our concerns if it seeks to deepen our partnership even further. Having you in place in India, Mayor Garcetti, would be critical to advance U.S. interests on these issues and many others. Ambassador Bloom, we welcome your nomination at this particularly challenging moment in the U.S.-Pakistan bilateral relationship. As I told this committee last month, the failure of our mission in Afghanistan was due in no small part to years of Pakistani double-dealing. Islamabad offered safe haven to the Taliban even as its militants targeted and killed U.S. troops. We need to have a serious conversation with the Pakistani government on the path forward, and I'm confident that you will deliver a tough message to them if confirmed. Beyond Afghanistan, I remain deeply concerned about the growing strength of extremist groups within Pakistan itself. The government has created an increasingly permissive environment for extremist groups to operate. Pakistan has also become an increasingly dangerous place for religious minorities, and I'm eager to hear your views on how to strengthen religious freedom in Pakistan. However, there are other many important equities in the bilateral relationship, such as curbing nuclear proliferation, managing tensions with India, responding to COVID-19. Your experience in Kabul and other hardship posts will be an asset, and I look forward to hearing how you'll address these challenges in Islamabad. Dr. Gutman, welcome and congratulations on your nomination. Your years of experience as the president of a leading university, your academic experience, and your powerful family history will no doubt serve us well. The importance of having a Senate-confirmed U.S. ambassador in Berlin cannot be overstated. This is a critical time for the transatlantic relationship and particularly for the United States and Germany. With the new German government, we have an opportunity to build on and renew decades of friendship and cooperation. It's no secret the U.S.-German relations suffered under the last administration. I'm confident that upon your confirmation, you will help return the relationship to one of respect and to a close strategic partnership. Germany is also a critical ally in our efforts to deter Russian aggression in Europe and prevent a renewed invasion of Ukraine. As Putin continues to try to bully his way through Europe, we need strong U.S. representation and close coordination with allies to stand up for our partners and reject illegitimate efforts to redraw the map of Europe. The urgency of these challenges underscores why we need our embassy in Berlin to have a confirmed ambassador in place immediately. And I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting your nomination and moving it sw swiftly forward. Let me turn to the ranking member for his opening. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and thank you to all of you for willingness to serve and, uh, and for your families who will share in the sacrifices you'll make. Uh, I want to turn first to the nomination of Ambassador to Germany. We're entering a new chapter in our relationship with Germany. After 16 years, uh, Angela Merkel is no longer, uh, no longer leads the country, and we, and we must build a new relationship with Germany's first three-party coalition. 
This transition comes at a critical point for the European continent. Most worrisome is the prospect of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. Despite Russia's huge troop presence on Ukraine's borders, Germany and this administration seems dead set on handing Putin another point of, of leverage, and that is Nord Stream 2. It's no secret I'm, and I and many other members uh, are uh, firmly opposed to this pipeline, and I'll continue to uh, efforts to see uh, it and Putin's influence in NATO are stopped. A full-fledged effort across the transatlantic alliance is required to deter Russia. Cooperation with Germany on this front must be a priority. The United States and Europe must also take on the challenge of the Chinese Communist Party together. If confirmed, cooperating with German counterparts to counter Chinese influence will need to be among our top priorities. Chinese influence is a problem all over the world, and uh, as we're going to see here in a minute, it is a uh, real problem right here in the United States. It's important this committee understands uh, how Dr. Goodman will handle these issues. Given the history of the close and extensive ties between China uh, and uh, the University of Pennsylvania, the institutions uh, you ran and directed during your tenure there, and still do. The U.S. Department of Education data shows that UPenn has received roughly $86 million. Let me say that again, $86 million in donations and contracts from sources uh, in China since 2014. It's safe to assume the actual amount is much higher given the universities are only required uh, to report gifts and contracts over $250,000. And uh, Dr. Uh, Gettman, I, I want to underscore here that this isn't unique to UPenn. This is an issue throughout uh, our higher education system and uh, we have uh, been drafting and discussing and attempting to pass legislation uh, to address this. We don't allow cash to flow to our politicians to, uh, to uh, influence them when they execute their duties of office. It just astounds me that uh, nonetheless we look the other way as this cash flows into our uh, higher education system. Um, it's, uh, you told the committee, uh, our staff, you are not aware of most foreign donations and contracts coming into UPenn and do not have a role in any process related to reporting of foreign donations and contracts to the Department of Education. I want to explore this during the question and answer period, but uh, I think the American public deserves an explanation, not only as to UPenn, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about it in, a con in the broader context of all higher education. Uh, we need to understand how and why, as president, you are not aware of the kinds of donations and contracts coming from authoritarian countries like China. I understand a university is a large operation. However, as captain of the ship, uh, you're in charge of it. I believe that's the attitude the chiefs of mission need to have as well. Today is your opportunity to clear the air on this, and we will give you that opportunity. I, I have in front of me uh, the... Uh, uh, large, or just a portion of the large number of these co uh, contributions that were made to UPenn, and uh, we're going to talk about those uh, when we get to the question and answer period. On the nomination of Ambassador to India, India is a critical U.S. partner in the Indo-Pacific. U.S.-India defense cooperation today is more robust than it's ever been, and the fruits of that were evident in U.S. support during India's border crisis with China last year. India plays a crucial role in the uh, Indian Ocean region and our strategic comp uh, competition with China. But we cannot ignore the reality of concerns over India's defense relationship with Russia. We need to ensure our relationship is healthy and strong for the long term, so we work together to advance a free and open Indo-Pacific. We must also work closely with India on counterterrorism. Our withdrawal from Afghanistan led to big shifts in India's security environment. It's a, a good thing that we have the nominees for both India and Pakistan on this panel so we can address these issues together uh, and thoroughly. This uh, is also an opportunity for more economic cooperation with India, especially in technology, health, and energy. We do still have economic uh, irritants to address, like lack of intellectual property protections and high and high tariffs. India's tariffs remain a key challenge for Idaho agricultural companies. The United States also needs to continue to advocate on human rights issues uh, in India. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on these important issues. On the nomination of Ambassador to Pakistan, for more than 20 years, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has been viewed through the lens of the war in Afghanistan. Pakistan has and should continue to play a key role in mitigating the fallout 
from this uh, administration's catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Whether it, whether it is humanitarian assistance, human rights, or counterterrorism, it's clear the end of U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan does not signal the end of American interests there. However, we are also presented with a rare opportunity uh, to reframe U.S.-Pakistan relationship, not solely focused on Afghanistan. For example, as we adopt our relationships uh, with India around competition with China, we must do so with an eye on the balance of power with all players in South and Central Asia. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on the nature of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship moving forward. With that, I'll you back. Thank you, Senator Rich. Thank you, Senator Rich. All right, we'll turn to our nominees now. Uh, we'd ask you to summarize your statement in about five minutes. Your full statement will be included uh, for the record. And we'll start with Ambassador Bloom and work our way down the dais. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rich, honorable members of this committee, thank you for considering my nomination to serve as ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. I am grateful to this committee for previously confirming me as ambassador to the Republic of Tunisia. I would like to start by thanking my family, my wife Deborah, who is here with me today, and my three children, Sarah, Nicholas, and Carl, who could not be here. Over more than 28 years in the Foreign Service, they have served with me, enduring frequent moves, emergency evacuations, and long periods of separation. And they have also shared with me the honor of serving our country abroad, an honor for which I have always been deeply grateful. Events in Afghanistan weigh heavily on me, having previously served there as Embassy Kabul's top political officer in 2012 and 13. I worked alongside colleagues in and out of uniform, some of whom gave their lives in the service of our country, some of whom were gravely injured, and many who still bear the invisible wounds of war. I also engaged with courageous Afghans who put themselves at great risk to build the Afghan state's institutions and stability. If confirmed, I will prioritize the safe relocation from Afghanistan of any U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, special immigrant visa holders, and other Afghans to whom we have a special responsibility along with their family members. Mission Pakistan also plays an important role on encouraging an inclusive Afghan government that respects and promotes the human rights of all individuals, including women and girls, members of minority groups, and ensuring that Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for international terrorism. If confirmed, I will press Pakistan to target all terrorist groups without distinction. I will also work with my colleagues to decrease tensions between India and Pakistan. I have been encouraged by the continued ceasefire along the line of control, Strong partnerships with India and Pakistan are not mutually exclusive. We need productive ties with both. Pakistan and India should decide the pace, scope, and character of their bilateral interactions. I will also promote U.S. commercial interests in Pakistan. I will encourage Pakistan to promote more transparent investments through sustainable financing with a focus on the environmental and social impacts of investment projects. Pakistan is a partner in the COVID-19 pandemic. In May of 2020, Pakistan donated 100,000 face masks and 25,000 protective suits to the United States to safeguard our health care workers in the early stages of the pandemic. The United States has in turn donated to Pakistan 26.7 million doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, as well as 200 ventilators. On climate, Pakistan has signed onto the Global Methane Pledge, announced a moratorium on approving new coal-fired power generation, and committed to having renewables provide 60% of electricity generation by 2030, and is implementing a 10 billion tree planting campaign. If confirmed as ambassador, I will never shy away from defending human rights in Pakistan, particularly freedom of religion and expression. Religious minorities in Pakistan have long faced discrimination, including accusations of blasphemy. These accusations have undermined the rule of law, threatened mob rule, and deeply damaged Pakistan's international reputation and have led to many deaths. If confirmed, I will speak out against violations of human rights and religious freedom. Pakistani journalists and members of civil society face kidnappings, assaults, intimidation, and disappearances. I will advocate for expanded protections for freedom of association and assembly and will meet with civil society partners regularly. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to close by saying we have an important opportunity 
to renew and strengthen the bilateral relationship with Pakistan. And I want to work with this committee and Congress to do so. Thank you for considering my nomination, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Mayor Garcetti. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, to all members of this committee. I'm honored to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee to be ambassador to, from the United States to the Republic of India. And let me start by thanking the President and Secretary Blinken for their trust and for this amazing opportunity to serve our nation. Few nations are more vital to the future of American security and prosperity than India. If confirmed, I look forward to building on the work of my predecessors to elevate our partnership to new heights. My parents, Gil and Suki Garcetti, are here today, the children and grandchildren of immigrants from Mexico and Russia, two public servants who first brought me to India as a teenager and who taught me how deeply we are connected to everyone in this world. Two people not with me today in person are always the best part of my day. My wife, Amy Elaine Wakeland, and our incredible and beautiful daughter, Maya. Amy has devoted her entire life to advocating for women and children. And Maya just turned 10 years old yesterday and is watching this hearing with her mother as she gets ready for school. And I just want to say good luck with your science test today, honey. I love you. In 1990, I visited India as the guest of Ambassador Bill Clark, who served under President H.W. Bush and who was, whose son was my college roommate. Inspired by this trip, I started studying Hindi and Urdu in college, Indian and cultural religious history. And at that time, U.S.-India ties languished in the shadow of Cold War mistrust. Annual trade stood at a paltry $2 billion. Defense trade was zero, and military interoperability was non-existence. The very idea of a U.S.-India strategic partnership would have been deemed laughable. Today, the fundamental nature of that strategic partnership is firmly ingrained here in Washington and in New Delhi. Twenty years ago, President Biden, when he was chair of this esteemed committee, called for a new and ambitious U.S.-India partnership. And thanks to successive administrations, Democratic and Republican, and the bipartisan work of this committee and Congress, that strong new chapter is upon us. In September, uh, President Biden hosted Prime Minister Modi and their Australian and Japanese counterparts for the first ever in-person Quad Leaders Summit here in Washington to reinforce cooperation among common challenges from COVID to climate. Most notably, an Indian vaccine manufacturer with support from Quad members will produce one billion additional vaccine doses for the world. If confirmed, I will endeavor to advance our ambitious bilateral partnership, united by a shared vision of a free and open and inclusive Indo-Pacific region. Even with a pandemic, our bilateral trade this year is expected to break a record. And if confirmed, I intend to champion an ambitious economic partnership with India to reduce market barriers, to bolster free trade, and to generate good middle-class American jobs. We all know India is situated in a tough neighborhood. If confirmed, I will extend efforts to strengthen India's capacity to secure its border, to defend its sovereignty, to counter terrorism, and to deter aggression. We'll do that through information sharing, counterterrorism coordination, joint freedom of navigation, patrols, and military exercises, which I have witnessed personally with my brave Indian counterparts, as well as sales of our best defense technologies in order to fully realize the potential of our major defense partnership. As an aside, I want to express my condolences to the Indian people and armed forces for the loss of Chief of Defense Staff General Bipin Rawat last week, who was a hero to his nation and a good friend to ours. If confirmed, I will work to advance partnerships in space, science, and flight, as well as other critical and emerging technologies. And as Senator Padilla mentioned, I've chaired C40, which is a global network of mayors from the largest cities of the world, to confront global climate change and to share the experience of LA, which is on track to be fully renewable power by 2035. And if confirmed, I will work closely with India on a similarly bold approach to promoting green energy through the International Solar Alliance and through the Agenda 2030 Climate and Clean Energy Partnership. But my friends, in the end, the bedrock of our relationship are the warm and deep ties between our peoples. They connect our nations, and it's embodied best perhaps by the four million strong Indian American diaspora I know in each of your states. It strengthens our nation, 
It serves at the highest level, including our vice president, and the nearly 200,000 Indian students and tens of thousands of Indian professionals contribute every single day to the strength of this country. And in addition, respect for human rights and strong democratic institutions are key elements of our relationship and values that are enshrined in both of our constitutions. And if confirmed, I will engage regularly and respectfully with the Indian government on these issues. Lastly, I acknowledge the weight and honor of responsibility of chief of mission uh, for the welfare of hundreds of US and thousands of locally employed staff at Embassy Delhi and our four consulates in India. In addition to the 950,000 US citizens who reside in India, and I want to assure this committee there will be no higher priority than their safety and security. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rish, thank you for the opportunity to share this testimony. And finally, let me say I recognize, I respect, and I relish the role of Congress in advancing our leadership. And I can't wait to regularly engage with you, with your staffs, and with the staff and members of this committee. If confirmed, I look forward to serving in India as it celebrates 75 years of independence and to shepherding an incredible next chapter in the U.S.-India partnership. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. Gatna. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rish, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I also thank the senators from my home state of Pennsylvania, Senator Casey and Senator Toomey, for their support and friendship. I would like to introduce my husband of 45 years, Michael W. Doyle, to the committee. His love and his wry wit provide constant sustenance, as do our daughter Abigail and son-in-law Jacob, who regret that they could not be here today. I am deeply grateful to President Biden and Secretary Blinken for placing their confidence in the daughter of a Jewish German refugee and a first generation college graduate to represent our nation to one of our closest and most important European allies. It would be my honor and duty, if confirmed, to work closely with this committee and Congress as the United States Ambassador to Germany. My father's journey to the United States made the most profound impression on me. After fleeing Hitler's Germany and saving the lives of his parents and siblings, Kurt Gutmann found a home in the United States. He instilled in me what it means to lead as an American. Never forget and always stand up against anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of bigotry and discrimination. Work to advance freedom and democracy, prosperity and the rule of law, national security and respect for the dignity of all. Democracy doesn't happen by accident, as President Biden has observed. We have to defend it, fight for it, strengthen it, renew it. My professional life and scholarship has been devoted to advancing freedom and democracy. As president of the University of Pennsylvania, the largest private employer in Philadelphia and the second largest in Pennsylvania, I expanded educational opportunities while championing civil dialogue and global diplomacy. Innovation and economic growth have soared, generating thousands of jobs while revolutionizing life-saving patient care. Most recently, Penn Research enabled companies in the United States and Germany to produce vaccines that are saving millions of lives in record time. If confirmed, I will work to further strengthen our bilateral and multilateral relationships with Germany. I highlight just three key priorities here. First, I will work closely with Congress and many agencies represented by Mission Germany to maximize the benefits of our bilateral relationship. This includes increasing trade and investment, combating climate change, strengthening global health, resisting weaponized energy flows, and countering corruption, terrorism, and malign influence. Second, I will engage in robust and inclusive public diplomacy to strengthen the foundations of our bilateral relationship. I will engage younger generations of Germans to discuss the United States' role in helping to rebuild a prosperous, unified, and democratic Germany, a story that is an example to the world. Third, I will advocate to strengthen our transatlantic alliances and European partnerships, central among them, NATO and the EU. Partnership with Germany is essential to deterring Russian plans to take further and more significant aggressive moves against Ukraine and to addressing the challenges to our shared security 
prosperity, and values posed by the PRC. An essential foundation for advancing our national interests will be avidly supporting the health, safety, security, and morale of Mission Germany. Our dedicated, hardworking, and unsurpassed public servants and uniformed personnel deserve no less. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, and members of the committee, I am greatly honored to have been nominated to serve as the United States Ambassador to Germany. If confirmed, I would be excited to begin work during this key juncture in our relations as a new German government is stepping onto the global stage. I pledge that I will serve the American people with honor and dignity, and I will work to foster an even stronger alliance between the United States and Germany based on our common interests and shared values. Thank you so much for your consideration. I welcome your questions. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your statements. Uh, we'll turn to a series of five-minute rounds. Before I begin that, I have uh, a few questions that's, uh, that are on behalf of the committee as a whole that speak to the importance that this committee places on responsiveness by all officials in the executive branch and that we expect and will be seeking from you. So I would ask each of you to provide verbally a yes or no answer to the following questions. Do you agree to appear before this committee and make officials from your office available to the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Do you commit to keep this committee fully and currently informed about the activities under your purview? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Do you commit to engaging in meaningful consultation while policies are being developed, not just providing notification after the fact? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. And finally, do you commit to promptly responding to requests for briefings and information requested by the committee and its designated staff? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. So all of the nominees have responded yes to all questions. The chairman will reserve his time, recognize uh, Senator Risch. Thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Goodman, I, I, one of uh, my pet peeves is the amount of money that's flowing into institutions of higher education in the United States from China. Most Americans are not aware of this. I, I have to tell you, I, I, in fact, I worked with the chairman as we tried to uh, uh, rein this up, and we're going to continue to do that. And I want to get your thoughts on this uh, while you're here. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I was shocked at this number of $86 million flowing into your, uh, uh, into, into your institution. I, I, I have to tell you, I was also was shocked when uh, uh, you indicated you really didn't know that much about this. What, what do you know about that? I, do you supervise this at all? Thank you. Um, and please let me put this question into context first of your excellent report of November 2020 on transatlantic cooperation uh, on China. The focus on the PRC's use of American institutions of higher education by having Confucius Institutes at universities to restrict academic freedom, to control faculty hiring and to threaten our core values is something that I share great concern about. At a time when Confucius Institutes were proliferating in the United States, I ensured that the University of Pennsylvania did not accept an invitation to have a Confucius Institute. That was in 2009 and have ever since been vigilant against the nefarious influences of the PRC. I think, that's, I think that's to your credit, by the way. I, I knew that you had uh, declined the invitation to have a Confucius Institute. And I, I, I think that's really to your credit. Um, but having said that, the $86 million is still pretty stunning, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a few of them here when, when you're done. But go ahead. Thank you for um, we are one on this issue. And second, piece of context which goes directly to your question uh, of, it's of the scale of Penn and what I do as president take due diligence on. We have 12 schools and six hospitals and 
The fundraising over the period you spoke about is over $5 billion, and over my presidency, over $10 billion. A very small fraction of that comes from China, less, considerably less than 1%. What I do make sure of, it's, so it's not surprising that I don't know of specific gifts and contracts, most of which are in our Wharton School of Business. Uh, but what I do know and what I make sure of is that no gifts, no contracts to the University of Pennsylvania are allowed to threaten academic freedom, are allowed to threaten national security. We do no classified research. We get about uh, one gift per three minutes uh, every few minutes and one separate different donor every few minutes of every day. And so I, it is not surprising that I am not familiar until actually being asked the question by you and your staff of the details of this. I wasn't familiar with those. What I am sure of is that the University of Pennsylvania has stood strong against accepting any gifts that would threaten academic freedom, that would threaten uh, national security, and as I said, we do no classified research. And this is aligned also with the concerns expressed in the 2019 staff report by Senators Portman and Carper and the Committee on Homeland Security. Thanks much. I think that's a fair answer. Um, and since it is 1%, I think that does put it in uh, context for us, and that'll give us a springboard to go forward here. I, you know, I look at these, and uh, I know university presidents. They certainly don't deal with the kind of money you do, but they look at this list every day to look at those uh, contributions that are coming in and seeing what they can do to advance them some more. So I, I'm surprised you're not at least somewhat more familiar with these. But I mean, you take things like uh, contributions from uh, the Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance. I can't imagine they're giving you money to promote capitalism, but maybe they are. Um, there's, there's all kinds of these that are uh, anonymous. I mean, million-dollar gifts. It says the uh, uh, country of origin is China, and it says anonymous. And there's, there's uh, dozens of these on here. Let me ask you this, because my, my time's up. Do you think it, if, if we gave the institutions of higher learning uh, time to... Uh, extricate themselves from this and uh, to uh, uh, back away from these kinds of, of uh, influence, particularly when you have a place like China where clearly some of this money is coming from slavery. We all know what's going on uh, with the Uyghurs, uh, and uh, th that, that is money that's being generated clearly as a result of slavery. Do you, do you think that uh, we could wean higher institutions uh, from uh, this cash flow if we gave them the time to, uh, to reconstitute, particularly when, as you noted, it's only 1% of what you get. But when you're talking about $86 million, they, they got to be getting something for it. And so it seems to me that, uh, that we ought to wean the institutions of higher learning from these kind of contributions. Senator, I agree with you that we should make sure that institutions of higher education do not accept gifts from the PRC or any foreign government that would compromise our values. I should say for the record that none of the gifts that the University of Pennsylvania accepted would it accept anonymously. The an anonymity is what the Department of Education in its reporting is required by law to do, but every gift under my presidency to the University of, Pres of Pennsylvania uh, had uh, was looked at by our legal team and so on, and none, none would be uh, anonymous. Mm, but I do agree with you that we should make sure that institutions of higher education uh, prevent uh, the kind of nefarious influence that the PRC is all too capable well, of well, and notorious for. Well, money always carries influence, and that's the difficulty. Uh, my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank all three of our nominees for their willingness to continue to serve and to serve our nation. We thank you very much, and we thank your families, because we know this is a, a family commitment. So we thank you for all that. 
Uh, Senator Risch, I think you know the, our concerns about the PRC's impact on our academic uh, centers around the nation has been, it's been around the entire country. We've had our issues in Maryland, and uh, I appreciate the fact that we need to continue to put a big spotlight on this, and I do congratulate Dr. Gutman for her leadership at Penn uh, in this area and so many areas of integrity. So, and thank that you. issue is bipartisan, Senator. No we question can all about agree it. On that. Yeah, it is. No question about it. Uh, Ambassador Bloom, I want to start, if I might, in regards to Pakistan. You mentioned during your opening statement the concern about human rights. Uh, we have found uh, significant. Uh, challenges on protecting basic human rights, recent actions taken by the Pakistani government in regards to restrictions on social media platforms, just the latest of the efforts. Tell me how you plan to use you, the tools available, if confirmed, to advance uh, the values uh, of human rights that America stands for uh, in your representation in Pakistan. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, uh, if confirmed to this position, I would certainly use my uh, uh, position to speak uh, publicly, um, along with my engagements at senior levels of the Pakistani government, uh, to uh, make clear uh, U.S. government priorities and values with regards to uh, human rights um, and personal freedoms. Uh, Beyond that, I think it's also very important to work with uh, local groups and individuals who are often courageously leading these fights on the ground. Um, and I would look for ways that we can continue to support those groups and strengthen our support for those groups and those voices uh, to make them more effective in uh, leading uh, the movement for change in Pakistan. And it, would you send a clear message that the embassy is open to those who are standing up to defend human rights within Pakistan to have a friendly venue uh, where they will have uh, a attentive ears? Absolutely, Senator. I would do that, and um, it, it certainly would be an open door for such groups. Thank you. appreciate that. Mayor Gossetti, I, I want to talk a little bit about India, if I might. Uh, India was just downgraded from the annual report by Freedom House from free to partly free. They recently enacted a, a Citizenship Amendment Act that is very much aimed against the Muslim population within India. So the same question to you. If you could be a little more specific, India is, is an incredibly important strategic partner of the United States, but the human rights records there are certainly anything but the way we would like to see them. So how do you balance our need to work with India as a strategic partner, but making advancements on behalf of human rights? Well, thank you very much, Senator. There's no question that the U.S.-India relationship uh, should be inter uh, underpinned by our common commitment to democracy, to human rights, and to civil society. It's enshrined in our constitutions, uh, the oldest democracy in the world and the largest democracy in the world. And human rights and defense of democracy is a pillar of our foreign policy. But to answer specifically, if confirmed, I will actively raise these issues. I'll raise them with humility. It's a two-way street on these. But I intend to engage directly with civil society. There are groups that uh, are actively fighting for the human rights of people on the ground in India uh, that will get direct engagement from me. We know that democracies are complicated. We can look at our own and at India's. But it's a cornerstone of our shared values. And I just want to say, for me, these will not be afterthoughts. My master's degree is in human rights and international law. I've fought for human rights on four different continents, and it'll be a core part of what I will pursue with my uh, Indian counterparts, if confirmed. I believe the citizenship amendment was passed just recently. Uh, the way it looks like it's going to be implemented, it will be very discriminatory against the Muslim population, uh, which is <laughs> very, very large. So do we have your commitment that you will be a voice in regards to any discrimination against minority groups such as the Muslim population within India? Absolutely, Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I would not only just bring it up, but it would not be something at the end as an obligation. It will be a core piece of what I'll be engaging uh, my Indian counterparts have confirmed with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Shaheen. Congratulations to each of our nominees. If confirmed, I look forward to working with you, and I know um, this committee feels the same way. 
Um, Mayor Garcetti, I'd like to begin with you because I have um, read with some concern accusations that one of your advisors engaged in a pattern of sexual harassment while employed for you and that um, you did not respond to those allegations in a way that would have uh, stopped the behavior. And I raise this because I want to give you a chance to respond to those allegations, but also because, um, as we all know, India is an ally, um, the world's biggest democracy, but it is a democracy where the rights of women and sexual assault and sexual harassment against women has um, been rampant over the years. They have made some real progress and women are speaking out more, but there's still a great deal of fear and intimidation for women to speak out on issues of harassment. And so I, I think it's very important that we model the behavior that we wanna see in our um, allies. And so I wanted to give you a chance to respond to those allegations. Thank you, Senator, and I, and I deeply appreciate not, not only the importance of that question that I understand, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity to address it as well. As simply said, Senator, harassment and discrimination have no place in the workplace, um, no place in our society, and I have zero tolerance for that. And I also know that words are not enough. We have to take persistent action to support and protect victims. And I've dedicated um, my professional life to doing just that. Um, whether it was in college setting up the National Student Coalition Against Harassment, whether it's as a naval officer adjudicating cases, or as a mayor where I have brought back policies to be able to centralize complaints and to allow folks to anonymously be able to report and seek justice. Um, in regards to the sp specific case, I want to say unequivocally that I never witnessed, nor was it brought to my attention, the behavior that's been alleged. And I also want to assure you, if it had been, I would have immediately taken action to stop that. In India, this will be a priority of mine because it's been a priority my entire life. My wife and I have served, and I know uh, Senator Rich's staff has worked closely, for instance, with the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. Um, I have on the ground experience with standing up law enforcement to go after uh, sexual harassment, sexual assault, civilian teams that roll out on domestic violence and sexual assault, calls for police officers to be able to engage and help people extricate themselves. Um, but I will, as ambassador, if confirmed, not have this as one of the issues. It's a core issue of my life and will be if confirmed as ambassador. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Um, I look forward to your strong stance when Thank you are confirmed. You. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gutman, as you're aware, I'm sure the United States and Germany last summer um, made a joint statement to Ukraine about the importance of um, taking, of responding to Russia's um, aggressive behavior in Ukraine and using, taking the opportunity to try to use Nord Stream 2 as a way to use energy to um, threaten Ukraine and to weaponize energy. As you're thinking about your role as ambassador, how will you work with Germany, with this new government in Germany around the Nord Stream 2 issue and around holding Russia accountable for its efforts to weaponize energy. Thank you, Senator, for that important question. I view our opportunity um, to advance our relationship to Germany uh, as one that is opened up by the new coalition government, uh, Germany being one of our strongest European allies. I believe Nord Stream 2 is a bad deal a bad deal for Germany, for Ukraine, terrible for all of Europe and the United States. You have my commitment to focus on a diplomacy that resists all threats, all human rights violations, especially from Russia and the PRC. Uh, I will call on Germany to meet its 2% commitment to NATO. That is an important security measure against Russia. I view the July joint statement as setting not only a commitment and, a f and an important floor on our expectations of alliance with our important ally, but it is a floor, not a ceiling, on what we may need to do together. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that everyone on this committee would agree um, with that strong position. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, 
Senator Coons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member. Uh, thank you to all three of today's nominees. I've enjoyed working with you in the past and look forward uh, to this next chapter in your service to our nation. Uh, I am thrilled um, the Biden administration continues to send uh, to the Senate and this committee such well-qualified nominees. Um, I'll just note at the outset, I I'm gravely concerned that for three such important countries, we don't have confirmed ambassadors, and it is the middle of December. I will do everything I can uh, to advance uh, your nominations through this committee and the floor and hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will work with us to achieve that goal. Um, if I might, uh, Mayor Garcetti, it's great to see you again. Um, and I think uh, your experience leading a global coalition of mayors uh, in combating climate change will serve you well in this new role. Um, your long experience um, in foreign relations as well as in leading a, a critical um, uh, city of our nation will be important. Talk to me about how you think we can continue to build on the U.S.-India relationship in terms of public health mm -hmm. um, and how we might strengthen and expand uh, our partnership around vaccine manufacturing uh, while still finding ways to respect um, American innovation and uh, protect some of the ways in which our inventions um, or creations, whether it's in copyright, trademark, or elsewhere, could be best protected. Well, thank you, Senator, and thank you for your friendship and collaboration over the years as well. Um, I'm very excited, if confirmed, about this part of the job. Public health um, on both sides of the Indo-Pacific are going to be critical, and the Quad Leaders Summit, I think, embodied that. It wasn't just U.S. and India, but also the two other countries that make up the Quad, joining together to support the manufacturing capacity of India to bring a billion more vaccine doses around the world, um, and vice versa for us to be able to make sure that we have supply chains uh, that are diversified from a single country. Um, I think that when it comes to public health, we have a very strong record together, whether it's in um, those uh, supply uh, chains or some of the innovations that we have. And I would just offer, if confirmed to my Indian counterparts, it's in our mutual interest to co-write rules of law that will allow intellectual property in India, which they develop. They are not just a country that um, produces vaccines made elsewhere. They are great innovators in the medical field. They want to protect that intellectual property, and we want to as well. When it comes to emergencies like a COVID pandemic, I think uh, the moves of this administration were the right ones to try to open that up, to try to work with the world community and the private sector to say in, in crisis moments, we can relax those rules in order to save lives. Uh, but for the long term, I think we have great jobs to produce both in India and most importantly here in the U.S. from that cooperation. Thank you, Mayor. And I look forward to even closer uh, U.S.-India ties both in um, security and strategy, but also in research uh, and, and economically and in public health. Dr. Gutmann, it's great to see you. Again, I recently led a bipartisan delegation to Berlin. We met with Chancellor Schultz and senior members of the Bundestag. Um, I'll be interested to see how their foreign policy, this new coalition government, uh, differs from the previous. Um, what do you think might be the challenges uh, in the Bundestag, given the coalition's statement in uh, maintaining consensus on foreign policy? And how do you think we can learn um, from the ways in which German advanced manufacturing, and in particular their workforce skilling practices, um, may show the way in uh, the new economic environment that we face post-pandemic? Thank you, Senator, and thank you for leading the CODEL to Germany and other countries at such an important time. I was heartened to see that Chancellor Schultz mentioned that there is continuity in German foreign policy. That said, I think there's always more to be done, and especially in light, as you mentioned, of the challenges of Russian aggression, of Chinese malign influence, Chinese predatory trade practices, Chinese genocide um, against Xinjiang, against the Uyghurs, and its aggressions uh, against Hong Kong, Tibet, um, and its threats to Taiwan. So I see this as an opportunity. I think there will be a challenge with the coalition, no doubt. I think we can address that with strong and um, respectful diplomacy. On the trade and investment, um, I, Germany, as you know, is our third largest source of foreign direct investment and accounts for over 850,000 jobs for Americans, and we, in turn, account for about 700,000 jobs in Germany. Germany has a model of apprenticeship that I believe um, we could build on in close partnership with Germany. It already exists in the United States in some states, and I think we could do more. It's a great alternative for talented, hardworking young people for whom four-year college is not 
the best. My father actually was apprenticing at the time he had to flee Nazi Germany, but that apprentice program has grown in the Democratic Republic, and I think we could learn and work with Germany on it. Thank you very much, Dr. Goodman. Could I ask forbearance for one more question, or should I move on? Go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, briefly, if I might, Ambassador Bloom, um, uh, you and the mayor will be um, nearby in a very tough neighborhood. I'll just be interested briefly in how you believe we can repair the U.S.-Pakistan relationship while also um, more successfully engaging them in the counterterrorism mission um, going forward. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think um, uh, it's very important that we find ways to uh, work together to address uh, some of these shared challenges that we're going to face on, on the counterterrorism front now. Um, you, we have to be clear-eyed about the troubled uh, history um, that we've had on these issues, but looking ahead, I think Pakistan has a shared interest uh, in, in ensuring that Afghanistan does not once again become host to uh, terrorist groups and a contributor to regional instability. Uh, and I think uh, we've seen some uh, signs recently in terms of Pakistan's uh, willingness to uh, engage with international partners on uh, issues of uh, uh, Afghanistan's future, uh, including in the extended uh, Troika format recently and the upcoming OIC uh, uh, meeting that's going to be dedicated to that question. So uh, we will, I will urge them to continue to uh, work together with international partners on a common set of objectives there. I think Thank then you. looking a little bit uh, you know, further ahead, I think there's things that we can do um, on the trade and investment front to grow the U.S.-Pakistani trade and investment uh, relationship in, in a way that benefits both our countries in a balanced way. Uh, there, I believe there are significant opportunities there that I would look for. Thank you, Ambassador. I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to congratulate each of the nominees for the positions. You're all very, very well qualified. I'll begin uh, with you, Ambassador Bloom, to just continue the line of thought. Um, in Pakistan, Pakistan arguably is China's closest ally in South Asia. So how would you see Islamabad balancing ties with the United States and China, particularly as we work more closely together with India on mechanisms like the Quad and the Indo-Pacific? Thank you, uh, Senator. I think um, uh, Pakistan has signaled very clearly um, an interest in diversifying their relationships um, uh, while their relationship with China has been important uh, recently, I think uh, the signal has been very clear that uh, they're interested in a uh, growing the relationship with the United States, doing business, uh, uh, treating the United States as a key partner for Pakistan's private sector. Uh, we've been Pakistan's largest export market uh, for decades. Uh, we enjoy strong people-to-people -people ties with the people of Pakistan um, through their diaspora, through civil society. Um, and uh, their stated aspirations of a geoeconomic driven foreign policy uh, interest uh, demonstrates their interest in diversifying uh, the relationship beyond uh, Beijing. Uh, so if confirmed to this, I would uh, position, I would look forward to uh, working on those issues with Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Mayor, great to see you again. Congratulations Thank to you, you. And, and to your family. I have a, a kind of a similar question, uh, not about China, but actually about yeah. Russia. Um, India and Russia have had this a long-standing defense tie. Um, prior to the passage of the Katza sanction law in 2016, um, India had begun to explore purchase of the S-400 air defense system from Russia. That could trigger Katza sanctions. There is an executive waiver possibility within the Katza sanctions. But talk to us a little bit about, as, we're, as we are doing more and more together with India and our military relations, a lot of uh, joint exercises. The Indian military does more joint exercises with the United States than any other nation. Uh, what is the potential danger to the U.S. India mill cooperation that um, the uh, acquisition of the S-400 system would create? Well, thank you, Senator, and great to see you as well. Um, you know, I, I don't want to prejudge the Secretary's decision about sanctions or a waiver, and I do want to tell the Chairman, Ranking Member, all the members, I do fully support the law of the land, the implementation of CATSA as law here, and part of that is the waiver provision, as you mentioned. If confirmed, uh, though, I would advocate the following, the continued diversification of India's weapons system, 
the threats to our own weapon systems if that diversification doesn't occur, because we have to protect our, our data and our systems, and work towards really growing this major defense partnership. Uh, I think it is one of the great success stories of the last few decades, from zero to $20 billion in procurement. Um, the intelligence sharing that we have, the interoperability, the exercises, the maritime um, work that we're doing. And I would seek, as somebody who's served alongside my Indian counterparts, to really deepen those people-to-people -people relationships in the military, the industrial coordination on that, and just be very clear about what the threats are to our system, especially uh, for new weapons systems uh, in the future that would come from outside um, the United States, or in this case, Russia. And Mr. Mayor, I, I, w I walked in right at the end of Senator Cardin's questions, but I know he was also asking you questions about human rights, and I just want to put yeah. an exclamation point on that. We have a sizable Indian diaspora community in Virginia, and many Sikhs and others feel like the there 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 is often uh, nationalism or religious uh, division that is sort of pushed at times of internal political challenge, and they feel victimized by that, and I hope that's a matter that you will take very, very seriously with yes. this important ally. Dr. Gutman, congratulations to you. Um, Senator Coons was covering what I wanted to cover, but, but just in particular, I just want to make sure that, uh, that Germany sees the same danger in Russian, um, Russia amassing forces on the Ukraine border as the U.S. does. We had some meetings earlier, Senator Coons and I, at the Halifax Security Forum with EU officials. They weren't from Germany, but they were EU officials. And, and it, it didn't make us feel good. They didn't seem to feel that the danger of the Russian troops amassing on the border was as significant as we believe it to be. Um, Germany believes the Nord Stream pipeline is very, very important, but I would have to b believe and expect that they would view an incursion into Ukrainian sovereignty, a further incursion by Russia as sort of an existential challenge in Europe, and I hope that they see that threat as seriously as we do. As do I, Senator, and if confirmed, I will take the good work of this committee and of Congress and administrations on what I understand the ongoing high-level discussions going on now to Germany and uh, really underscore how important it is to act strongly in alliance against the aggressions of Russia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Van Hollen is with us virtually. Senator Van Hollen. Can you Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, loud and clear. All right. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to all of you on your uh, nominations. Uh, Dr. Gutman, as you mentioned in your opening statement and in response to, to questions, um, you're going to be representing the United States uh, with a critical uh, NATO ally, Germany, um, with the new government, uh, and at a time uh, where we're witnessing ongoing uh, Russian aggression, uh, especially threats to sovereign, the sovereignty of Ukraine. And so uh, I know that you understand uh, the severity of the situation. I, I hope the, the Biden administration and Germany uh, will agree if, that if, if Russia takes any offensive actions uh, or invades uh, Ukraine, there would be an immediate snapback uh, of the Nord Stream 2 uh, sanctions. Uh, Mayor Garcetti, congratulations uh, to you on your nomination. Uh, as you know, India is a critical U.S. partner in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I want to salute the Biden administration's efforts to further expand uh, the Quad relationship uh, and India's uh, role in it. Uh, and as been indicated earlier, we're working with India uh, to try to develop vaccines uh, to address the challenges throughout the developing world. Um, Maryland has a company, Novavax, uh, that has teamed up with the Serum Institute of India uh, and have pledged to provide 1.1 billion doses to COVAX uh, to distribute uh, to the neediest places uh, around the world. That's uh, still going through the final uh, you know, hoops uh, of, of getting uh, getting uh, accepted, but I'm confident that that's going to happen and look forward to staying in touch with you about that. Um, Ambassador Blom, thank you for your uh, service uh, 
over many years in the Foreign Service and your most recent uh, posting uh, in, in Tunisia. Um, as, as we discussed when I met you earlier, um, I've been concerned uh, with the lack of a real strategy uh, from the administration as it relates uh, to Pakistan. Um, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on how we can more fully engage uh, both economically, um, politically, and on security issues um, at the highest levels. Um, you know, Pakistan, as you know, is an important country at any time. Um, it has an especially important role right now with the withdrawal of U.S. Uh, and other forces uh, from Afghanistan uh, and the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Uh, there are many who exaggerate uh, the amount of influence that Pakistan has over the Taliban. Uh, people forget that Pakistan has waged its own bloody war against the Pakistani Taliban, uh, the TTP. Um, and as you know, Pakistan has not yet recognized uh, the new government um, in Kabul, the new Taliban government. At the same time, uh, clearly, Pakistan has uh, ties to elements of the Taliban and could pay, play a, a positive role, uh, potentially, uh, going forward uh, with respect to our demands uh, on the new Taliban government. So. Here's the question. What, what do you think our strategy should be? Uh, what role can Pakistan play in furthering our goals together with others in the international community with respect to the goals we've set out uh, in Afghanistan uh, and the demands we've placed on the new government there? Thank you, Senator, uh, for that question. Very important one. I think, um, I think there are opportunities to work with Pakistan on uh, uh, the agenda that we've set out for Afghanistan. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, I think that we can identify a um, number of areas of common ground that we have with Pakistan in trying to um, achieve a uh, government that's uh, inclusive in nature inside Afghanistan, uh, one that uh, can help avert uh, humanitarian uh, catastrophe inside the country, stabilize the economy, uh, and ensure that uh, Afghanistan doesn't again become a source of uh, terrorist threats to the United States and our allies. We've set these out in a number of dialogues that we've had recently um, uh, in international fora with Pakistan, including those hosted in the extended Troika format and, uh, and in the upcoming OIC. So uh, I think we've established a basis that we can uh, work with Pakistan on those important uh, on those important uh, strategic issues. Um, we have to find a way to uh, make progress on this and work together on these issues. Um, beyond that, again, as we discussed in, in our meeting, Senator, I think um, uh, we can also look at ways we can build the relationship with Pakistan on other bases that are important, including the trade and investment ties that I mentioned before. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I would just ask you if confirmed to use your influence to arrange a telephone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Khan. Um, I think this is a, a self, um, this is an own goal. Um, this is an unforced error on our part. It uh, would be, a, I think, an important gesture uh, at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Rubio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I won't use, hopefully, my whole time. I know we're pending a vote. It's already started. So um, I guess... Uh, Ms. Gutman, I wanted to, I know Senator Rich has already asked about the, the, the money the entities, the Chinese entities gave to the university. And good morning to all of you. Thank you for your, all your willingness to serve and, and be here. Um, I wanted to ask you more specifically about China and, and Germany. Germany is, uh, is China's largest European trading partner. And since 2017, I think China has been Germany's largest trading partner. Um, and it's concerning because while other governments have been more forward leaning, for example, on the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics and, and speaking out about the uh, genocide of the Uyghurs, uh, Germany's obviously been more resistant, and I think the commercial links explain why. What, what is generally your assessment of how the Germans view China on a global scale, and, um, and what, what are your plans or thoughts about getting them to become more engaged? 
Thank you for that very important question, Senator. My sense is that there has been a balancing in the German government between its important economic ties with China and its concerns for human rights and democracy and the threats thereof. If confirmed, I would lean in on this to emphasize our government's position and our society's position that the ongoing genocide in Xinjiang province against the Uyghurs, the threats to fair market practices, cybersecurity threats, and I could go on and on and will, if confirmed with the German government, pose economic as well as security threats to Germany, to Europe, to the free world, and of course to the United States. I see this as an opportunity with the new government that there is an opening to help build and reset Germans' position. I will very much urge Germany in concert with this committee to join us in boycotting the Olympics, to um, stand down uh, and speak up against Chinese practices in alliance. It will be to the betterment of German security and most important to me, if confirmed, to the interests and the values of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. There are a series of votes going on. There's no other member that I know of seeking recognition at this time. The chair has a series of very significant questions, but he's going to submit it. I'm going to submit it for the record. Um, I would expect substantive answers to my questions. I would hate to be the one holding you up for your business meeting. So uh, the, this record will remain open till the close of business tomorrow. I'd ask members to submit their questions. I'd ask the nominees to answer those questions expeditiously and substantively so we can consider your nominations before a business meeting or the thanks of the committee this hearing is adjourned. I'd like to have this submitted for the record. Without objection, the... Um, the uh, documents that Senator Risch has asked will be included in the record, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chair.